Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation, the fourth in the series, Empower Hour, What You Need to Know About Clinical Trials. The presentation is intended to give general information and is not intended as legal advice. This webinar also does not establish an attorney-client relationship. There will be time for Q&A after the presentation. I also welcome questions during the presentation if they would be beneficial for the group. One last thing, I also want to say that I hope to be able to answer your questions, but there may be instances I might have to tell you I don't know it, either because it's not information I have offhand or it might be too specific for today. However, I encourage you to fill in an online intake with us so we can properly research the information. Before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items. I will do my best to leave time for questions at the end of the workshop. This presentation is recorded. The questions that I will be answering at the end will not be recorded. The CLRC stands for the Cancer Legal Resource Center. We are a program of the Disability Rights Legal Center. The CLRC provides information and resources to people affected by cancer, including patients, survivors, caregivers, and healthcare professionals. Our resources are free, regardless of income. This webinar is part of our Empower Hour series. While the series is sponsored by the Tower Cancer Research Foundation, a generous grant from them and from CGEN, this webinar is solely supported by CGEN. We have an upcoming webinar, our Health Interns and Open Enrollment webinar. That will be uh, the last webinar of the Empower Hour series. So we're so excited um, for that webinar and we hope that you will join us. The CLRC also maintains a library of fact sheets on a variety of cancer-related legal issues on our website, including a resource called our Patient Legal Handbook. The handbook provides a brief overview of many of the most common issues and questions that people living with cancer and their families have. We have a version that we are uh, taking orders for, and we want to give thanks to our generous sponsors, the American Cancer Society and Breakaway from Cancer. If you're interested in receiving copies of our handbook, please submit an order on our website. We send it out for free. Uh, we also have PDFs of the handbook and in English and Spanish available to download for free. We have webinars throughout the year. Um, of course, this one is very special as part of the Empower Hour series. Uh, our webinars cover a variety of topics. They are The previous ones are on our website. We talk about health insurance options, financial toxicity, housing rights, so if you're interested in registering for any of our upcoming webinars as well, please sign up um, online and check out our website as well while you're there. So what are some common cancer-related legal issues? People often ask, what does cancer have to do with the law? This is a list of some cancer-related legal issues. Cancer affects the patient, survivor, families, healthcare professionals. It impacts many different areas of the law. If someone has a legal question and is affected by cancer, whether or not the topic is listed here, they can contact the CLRC for more information. The CLRC also has a professional panel, which includes attorneys from across the country who help those with cancer if a caller needs help with a matter in their state and practice area. You saw on the previous slide the practice areas that attorneys handle, but just to recap some of them, landlord-tenant, health insurance matters, medical malpractice, estate planning, employment law, and divorce law. It's a minimal commitment. All that the attorney agrees to is a half-hour consultation. It is very easy to apply, and it is free to apply. Now, as you can see on your screen, there are we are the Cancer Legal Resource Center, and of course, we like to provide you with resources. So uh, certainly um, check out our the way to fill out an online intake, or if you'd prefer to uh, leave us a message, you can call us at the toll-free number. You don't have to do both. We will get to you, so make sure to figure out the best way you want to contact us, and of course, that's the link to our webinar. So um, the 
webinars are all posted on our YouTube channel after, so you can feel free to not have to take notes during this presentation. You may if you'd like, but if there's a part of this presentation that you'd like to listen to again, or you'd like to write something down, you can always pause it on the YouTube video, which will be posted afterwards. So uh, certainly check out our, our website and our previous webinars online. All the information we provide at the CLRC is free, though we do not provide legal advice or direct representation. Um, if you have questions about your specific situation, you can contact us. You don't have to ask a question today, or if you're thinking about the presentation after and all of a sudden a question comes to you, you can contact us and all you have to do is, is go on our website or uh, call the phone number that, that you see on your screen. We can research laws and resources for you and provide you with free customized resources everything is confidential. So let's dive in. More than 1,300 cancer medicines are in various stages of testing, according to a report released in 2020 by Pharma, a drug maker's trade group. This list includes studies of already approved drugs that are being studied for new uses, as well as phase one studies of unapproved agents. So as you can see in your screen, an overview of what we'll be discussing today, this is, of course, a very hot topic right now, um, clinical trials. So we're going to break things down. So at the end of this hour, you're going to feel more empowered, hence the Empower Hour series about information that's helpful to you or to someone else. So just in case if you ever want to pursue a clinical trial, you have the information you need. And even if you're deciding whether it's a good option for you, it is helpful to know the context and the information so you can make the best decision for yourself. So. Why are clinical trials important? Cancer clinical trials have led to scientific advances that have increased doctors' understanding of how and why tumors develop and grow. As a result, doctors have made progress in preventing cancer and diagnosing cancer, slowing or stopping the development of cancer, and finding cancers that have come back after treatment. Because clinical trials may involve hundreds or even thousands of people, it often takes a long time to find out the results. Still, clinical trials remain the most value, reliable and only accepted scientific method to find out if a new treatment works better than our current standard of care. Despite the promise offered by clinical trials, historically less than 5% of adults with cancer enrolled in them. There is a more recent article, such as in Cancer Therapy Advisor, that says that it may be closer to 20% or more. But this historically low level of participation slows progress in the development of new, more effective therapies. And that's part of the reason I want to share this information with you today. In contrast, actually, more than 60% of children with cancer receive treatment through a clinical trial. Approximately 80% of children with cancer survive long term, compared with half of adults. The increased survival rate for children can be directly linked to enrollment of patients in cl cancer clinical trials over many years whose experience led to better treatments and better outcomes. So first things first, what exactly is a clinical trial in the first place? So a clinical trial is a research study designed to find out if new treatments drugs or procedures are safe and effective. Some people are afraid of the uncertainty of new treatments, but clinical trials often provide patients with access to high quality care and treatments before they are widely available. Government and non-governmental organizations may sponsor clinical trials, and the clinical trials are often available at a variety of hospitals and doctor's offices. Many clinical trials evaluate new treatments to find out whether they are safe effective and possibly better than the current or standard treatment. However, there are many different types of clinical trials. Some studies test different combinations of existing treatments, new approaches to radiation therapy or surgery, and new methods of treatment. There are also clinical trials that study new ways to ease symptoms and side effects during treatment and manage the late effects that may occur after treatment. In addition, there are ongoing studies about ways to prevent cancer. 
Unfortunately, testing drugs or new treatments or lack thereof on humans has a dark history. And a lot of people, especially minorities, are wary of clinical trials because of this history. And I just wanna say that is completely understandable in terms of um, information that, that we have out there. And the goal is really not to convince someone that they must do a clinical trial. It is really to dispel myths and to break down what information is most useful to people. So I think it is worth talking about the history so that we can understand why people have hesitations. And it's not necessarily just minorities that would have hesitations. It could be people from all backgrounds that have heard about what happened. So I wanna just make sure that we're all on the same page. For example, there were some pretty horrific experimentation on humans that took place during World War II like at concentration camps by Nazis and on Chinese civilians and other prisoners of war by Japan's Unit 731. Another example is the now infamous Tuskegee study. The infam infamous clinical study conducted between 1932 and 1972 by the US Public Health Service. The purpose of this study was to observe the natural progression of untreated syphilis in rural African-American men in Alabama under the guise of receiving free health care from the United States government. The men were told that the study was only going to last six months, but it actually lasted 40 years. After funding for treatment was lost, the study was continued without informing the men that they would never be treated. None of the men infected were ever told that they had the disease, and none were treated with penicillin, even after the antibiotic was proven to successfully treat syphilis. Also, Henrietta Lacks, she was an African-American woman whose cancer cells are the source of the HeLa cell line, the first immortalized cell line and one of the most important cell lines in medical research. Lax was the unwitting source of these cells from a tumor biopsies during treatment for cervical cancer at Johns Hopkins Hospital in 1951. These cells were then cultured by George Otto Gay, who created the cell line known as HeLa, which is still used for medical research. As was then the practice, no consent was obtained to culture her cells, nor were she or her family compensated for their ext extraction or use. These days, there's a lot more safeguards in place to protect patients. Researchers have come have to go through a lengthy process in order to get the US Food and Drug Administration, otherwise known as the FDA, to give permission to test it in humans. The investigation new drug or IND application. Before a clinical trial can even be started, the research must be approved. An investigational new drug or IND application or request must be filed with the FDA when researchers want to study a drug in humans. The IND application must contain certain information as described below. The FDA reviews this information before human clinical trials start. Here's some in, of the information required on an IND request. First of all, preclinical studies Results from studies, including those on animals, allow the FDA to decide whether the product is reasonably safe for testing on humans. This part may also include any experience with the drug in humans, if the drug has been used or studied in another country, for example. Manufacturing information. This explains how the drug is made, who makes it, what's in it, how stable it is, and more about the physical qualities of the drug. The FDA uses this information to decide whether the company can make batches of the drug that will, that will always be exactly the same. Clinical protocols and investigator information. Detailed outlines for the planned clinical studies called study protocols are looked at to see if the study might expose subjects to unnecessary risks. Information on the clinical investigators who will supervise the study is reviewed to find out if they, they're qualified to run clinical trials. Finally, the research sponsor must commit to getting informed consent from the research subjects, having the study reviewed by an institutional review board or IRB, and following all the rules required for studying investigational new drugs. Various committees and agencies oversee patient safety before, during, and after a clinical trial. 
Institutional Review Board, IRB. And IRB is an independent committee of doctors, statisticians, experts who prepare and analyze statistics, community advocates, clergy, lawyers, and others who ensure that a clinical trial is ethical and that the rights and welfare of study participants are protected. Every clinical trial in the United States must be approved and monitored by an IRB to make sure the risks are as low as possible and that any risks are outweighed by potential benefits. All institutions that conduct or support medical research involving volunteer, volunteers must, by federal regulation, have an IRB that approves the clinical trial before it begins and reviews the research periodically until it is completed. Federal agencies. Federal agencies also approve and monitor clinical trials, including the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, or FDA, and the National Institutes of, of Health, NIH. The FDA and NIH are responsible for approving drugs and monitoring research. Both agencies make and enforce regulations to ensure the safety of clinical trial participants. Data Safety Monitoring Board, or DSMB. The DSMB is an independent group of doctors, medical ethicists, statisticians, and other health professionals that monitor a clinical trial for safety and scientific relevance throughout the study period. For example, if a new treatment is causing many patients to drop out of the study because of severe side effects, the DSMB may recommend stopping the study Alternatively, sometimes a new treatment works so well that it is unethical to continue to give it to one group of patients and not the other. In this case, the DSMB may recommend stopping the standard of treatment and offering the new treatment to all participants in the study. A DSMB is especially useful for large clinical trials that are taking place in many locations because they review all of the data accumulated from clinical trial sites. A DSMB is separate from an IRB. The IRB usually looks at the clinical trial before it starts. The DSMB reviews the study after it starts and makes recommendations to the IRB about stopping or continuing the study. In addition to the regulatory safeguards in place for clinical trials, patients have certain rights when it comes to participating or not in a clinical trial. Patients are not always aware of their rights regarding clinical trials. Once you've signed up, you are not required to stay in it, and you're never required to sign up for a trial in the first place. So let's talk a little bit more about people's rights. You have the right to not participate or to drop out at any time. You have the right to be given comprehensive information about the study. You have the right to ask questions and be given answers as soon as possible. One of the most important protections for patients in clinical trials is the idea of informed consent. Informed consent is more than just getting the patient or the person with cancer to say yes or no to participation. It includes, as you can tell from the name, actually informing the patient about the pros and cons so that the patient can make a decision based on important information. In other words, the way that I like to think about it you should know and be able to explain to someone that is unfamiliar with medicine what the study, what the goal of the study is, what it's supposed to do, and what are the pros and cons. If you can explain it in plain English, then you know you understand it, and you also know that there's potentially benefits that will really help, but there may be also be downsides. Informed consent. Research institutions are required to obtain informed consent from every person who decides to participate in a clinical trial. Informed consent is used to protect the safety and privacy of a person enrolled in a clinical trial. Participating in the informed consent process. Researchers obtain informed consent by telling potential volunteers about the nature of a particular clinical trial. This typically involves one or more conversations between the research participant, the patient, and the trial investigators, the research, researchers conducting the clinical trial. 
research nurses or assistants, and the patient's doctor. It also includes a review of the written consent form with the patient. During the ongoing informed consent process, the research team should list all of the patient's options so that the person understands all the available treatment choices. The research team should also explain how the new treatment is different from the standard treatment. The research team must also list all of the potential risks and benefits, if any, of the new treatment, which may or may not be different from the risks and benefits from the standard treatment. Finally, the research team must explain what, what will be required of each patient in order to participate in the clinical trial, including the number of doctor visits, tests, and the schedule of treatment, as well as the right to withdraw from the study at any time without penalty. Other topics covered during this discussion include potential costs, protection of privacy, and whom to contact with questions or concerns. Informed consent for a clinical trial or investigational drug or procedure where the new treatments are compared to the current standard treatment usually involve, includes more information than the consent for standard treatment. The informed consent process should tell you what the clinical trial is set up to find out, what is expected of you, what will be done, and how long you will take part, expected benefits, what's known and not known about the new drug or procedure, any possible risks to you if known, whom you should contact with questions about or problems with the study, other possible treatment options, that you can leave the study with no penalty and opt for standard medical care at any time, how your personal information will be protected. The informed consent process is meant to give you ongoing explanations that will help you make educated decisions about whether to start or stay in a clinical trial. Tip, keep a copy of the consent form. Ask for a copy if one isn't offered to you. You may also request a copy of the protocol, the full study plan that describes all the details of the clinical trial. So now that you know some of the safeguards to starting a trial or enrolling patients, we're gonna talk about the different phases that trials go through. Usually we just talk about phases one through three. Phase zero, clinical trials, exploring if and how a drug, new drug may work. Phase zero studies aren't used widely and there are some drugs for which they wouldn't be helpful. Phase zero studies are very small, often with fewer than 15 people, and the drug is given only for a short time. They're not a required part of testing a new drug. Even though phase zero studies are done in humans, this type of study isn't like the other phases of clinical trials. The purpose of this phase is to help speed up and streamline the drug approval process. Phase zero studies are exploratory studies and often use only a few small doses of a new drug in new patients, in a few patients. They may test whether the drug reaches the tumor, how the drug acts in the human body, and how cancer cells in the human body respond to the drug. The patients in these studies might need extra tests, such as biopsy scans and blood samples as part of the study process. The biggest difference between phase zero and later phases of the clinical trials is that there's almost no chance the volunteer will benefit by taking part in a phase zero trial. The benefit will be for other people in the future. Because drug doses are low, there's also less risk to the patient in phase zero studies compared with phase one studies. Phase one. This is the first step in testing a new drug or procedure with people. Researchers test safe dosages with the different ways of giving the drug or procedure to the patient. For example, giving a drug orally or through IV injection. The researchers carefully observe any side effects. The purpose of phase one clinical trials is to learn how safe the drug or therapy is in people, find the best dose and schedule and study how it might help treat cancer. The purpose of phase one clinical trials is to learn how safe the drug or therapy is in people, and it's important to really think about what the drug does to the body and what the body does with the drug. Safety is the main concern at this point. Doctors keep a close eye on the people and watch for any serious side effects. Because of the small numbers of people in phase one studies, rare side effects may not be seen until later. Placebos, sham or inactive treatments are not part of phase one trials. These studies usually include a small number of people, typically up to a few dozen. Often people with different types of cancer can take part in the same phase one study. These studies are usually done in major cancer centers. 
These studies are not designed to find out if the new drug works against cancer. Overall, phase one trials are the ones with the most potential risk, but phase one studies do help some patients. For those with life-threatening illnesses, weighing the potential risks and benefits carefully is key. Phase two. If a trial is successful at phase one and the drug is shown to be safe enough, it will continue to a phase two trial. Phase two, these trials study both the safety and effectiveness of a treatment and evaluate how the drug or procedure affects your body. These studies are usually specific to one type of cancer and often have fewer than 100 patients. About 70% of drug candidates advance from phase one to phase two trials where the focus is on side effects and efficacy, according to the most recently available FDA data. Key points of phase one clinic, phase two clinical trials, usually a group of 25 to 100 patients with the same type of cancer get the new treatment in a phase two study. They're treated using the dose and method found to be the safest and most effective in phase one studies. In a phase two clinical trial, all the volunteers usually get the same dose, but some phase two studies randomly assign participants to different treatment groups, much like what's done in phase three trials. These groups may get different doses or get the treatment in different ways to see which provides the best balance of safety and effectiveness. Phase two studies are often done at major cancer centers, but may also be done in community hospitals or even doctor's offices. Large number of patients get the treatment in phase two studies, so there's a better chance that less common side effects may be seen. If enough patients benefit from the treatment and the side effects aren't too bad, the treatment is allowed to go on to a phase three clinical trial. Only 33% of drugs then move from phase two to phase three, according to the most recently available FDA data which also says approximately 50% of drugs that advance to phase three succeed. Phase three, these trials compare the new treatment with the current standard treatment. Because doctors do not yet know which treatment is better, study participants are often picked at random, called randomized, to get either the standard treatment or the new treatment. When possible, neither the doctor nor the patient knows which of the treatments the patient is getting. This type of study is called a double blind study. Key points of phase three clinical trials. Most phase three clinical trials have a large number of patients, at least several hundred. These studies are often done in many places across the country or even around the world at the same time. Phase, two cl phase three clinical trials are more of often likely to be offered by community-based oncologists. These studies tend to last longer than phase one and two studies. Placebos may be used in some phase three studies but they're never used alone if there's a treatment available that works. As with other studies, patients in phase three clinical trials are watched closely for side effects and treatment is stopped if the side effects are too bad. In the United States, when phase three clinical trials or sometimes phase two studies show a new drug is more effective and or safer than the current standard treatment, a new drug application, otherwise known as NDA is submitted to the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, for approval. The FDA then reviews the results from the clinical trials and other relevant information. Based on the review, the FDA decides whether to approve the treatment for use in patients with the type of illness that the drug was tested on. If approved, the new treatment often becomes standard of care, and newer drugs will then have to be tested against it before being approved. If the FDA feels that more evidence is needed to show that the new treatment's benefits outweigh its risks, it may ask for more information or even require that more studies be done. Phase four. These trials research the long-term safety and overall effectiveness of treatment. These studies take place after treatment has been approved for widespread use. Not all drugs go through phase four. Key points of phase four clinical trials. Phase four studies look at drugs that have already been approved by the FDA. These drugs are available for doctors to prescribe for patients, but F phase four studies might still be needed to answer important questions. These studies may involve thousands of people. This is typically the safest type of clinical trial because the treatment has already been studied a lot and might have already been used in many people. 
phase four studies look at safety over time. These studies may also look at other aspects of the treatment, such as quality of life or cost effectiveness. You can get the drugs used in a phase four trial without enrolling in a study. And the care you would get in a phase four study is much, very much like the care you would expect if you were to get the treatment outside of a clinical trial. But in phase four studies, you're helping researchers learn more about treatment and doing a service to future patients. Possible benefits. Getting access to high quality care. Close monitoring by doctors, playing a role in improving future treatments, and you might be the first to benefit from a new treatment or procedure. For the most part, clinical trials other than phase zero have some of the same potential benefits. You might help others who have the same condition in the future by helping to advance cancer research. You could have access to treatment that's not otherwise available, which might be safer or work better than current treatment options. You may increase the total number of treatment options available to you, even if you haven't yet had all the standard treatments. You may feel you have more control over your situation and are taking a more active role in your healthcare. You'll probably get more attention from your cancer care team and more careful monitoring of your condition and possible side effects of treatment if you take part in a clinical trial. Some study sponsors may pay for all or part of your medical care and other expenses during the study. This isn't true for all clinical trials. Be sure you know what's expected, who's expected to pay for your care before you enroll in the study. So that's another really important question to ask. Possible risks. New treatments may not work. Treatments may cause side effects. New treatments may not be better than the old. You might need to get additional tests, which may be uncomfortable, inconvenient, or time consuming. Some of the possible downsides of being in a study can include the new treatment may have unknown side effects or other risks, which may or may not be worse than those from existing treatments. This is especially true of early phase trials. As with other forms of therapy, the new treatment may not work for you even if it helps others. There may be inconveniences such as more frequent office visits and testing, as well as time and travel commitments. If you take part in a randomized clinical trial, you may not have a choice about which treatment you get. If a, the study is blinded, you and maybe your doctor won't know which treatment you're getting, although this information is available if needed for your safety. Sometimes patients are concerned that if they participate in a clinical trial, that they might get a placebo instead of current treatment. A placebo is an inactive drug or treatment in a clinical trial. It is sometimes referred to as a sugar pill. Some clinical trials called placebo-controlled clinical trials compare a new treatment with a placebo, an inactive drug or treatment. The use of placebos alone in cancer clinical trials is rare. They are used when there is no effective standard treatment available or they are given in addition to a standard treatment. They are also given along with treatment to manage any symptoms and side effects of the cancer called supportive or palliative care. The research team will let participants know when a placebo is a possible option in the study. Now that you have a basic understanding of how trials work, the next hurdle is actually figuring out if and whether there are clinical trials you might benefit from. The first place to start is with your doctor. Here are some questions you might want to ask to start the conversation about clinical trial enrollment or eligibility. This also might be a good idea even if you're not open to a clinical trial at this time, but you kind of just want to find out what's out there in case that might be an option that you would consider in the future. You could always just keep asking questions and follow whether the clinical trial might be something that you'd like to explore. What clinical trials are open to me? Where are they located and how do I find out more about them? What is the purpose of this clinical trial? What are the possible risks of this clinical trial? What are the potential benefits? Why are you recommending this specific clinical trial for me? What other treatment options are available to me? Does this clinical trial include the use of a placebo or an inactive treatment? 
what will be done with the tissue samples? Do I need to donate these in order to participate in the study? What tests will be done on the tissue sample? What is a biomarker? Will these be tested in a clinical trial? Who will be coordinating my overall care if I enroll in the clinical trial? What costs are associated with this clinical trial? Can you help me find out which costs are covered by my insurance and which ones I'm responsible for? If I'm worried about costs related to my cancer care, who can help me? Your doctor may already be aware of trials that you're a good match for. If not, you have some options for trying to research trials on your own. However, some of these databases are not particularly user-friendly. CenterWatch. This is a publishing and information services company that offers a list of institutional review board, IRB approved clinical trials. Clinicaltrials.gov. This database of publicly and privately supported clinical trials is maintained by the National Library of Medicine at the NIH. It provides information about more than 100,000 studies involving patients that are researching a wide variety of diseases and conditions, including cancer, in all 50 states and more than 150 countries. Emerging Med Navigator. Emerging Med offers a phone and internet-based service that identifies clinical trial options that match a patient's specific diagnosis, stage, and treatment history. Clinical trial specialists provide telephone support upon request to help, collect el help connect eligible patients with IRB-approved study sites that are enrolling new participants. National Cancer Institute, or NCI, clinical trials. The NCI, part of the National Institutes of Health, is the federal agency that provides funding for most U.S. cancer clinical trials. This comprehensive site provides information on both open and closed clinical trials that are funded by the government, as well as many sponsored by pharmaceutical companies, medical centers, and some international organizations. Disease-specific listing. Below is a free search engine that provides clinical trial listings for a specific type of cancer, breastcancertrials.org. This is a not-for-profit online service that helps users find breast cancer-specific clinical trials that might be right for them. The site offers study summaries, a way for users to share their online health history with research sites, and an alert service that notifies users of recently added clinical trials. Breastcancertrials.org includes studies sponsored by the NCI, public research foundations, and the pharmaceutical slash biotechnology industry. Children's Oncology Group. This is the best place to search for pediat pediatric cancer clinical trials. Most are run through them. I'm just gonna leave this screen up for a moment in case you wanna jot down a URL. Of course, we're the Cancer Legal Resource Center, so we provide resources, but I wanna make sure that you have this information, even though you can access it later on our YouTube site. What if I get turned down? So one of the questions we get is, what if I get rejected from this clinical trial? Each clinical trial follows a set of rules called a protocol that describes who can participate in the study and how the treatment will be given and monitored. All clinical trials have requirements about who can join, called inclusion and exclusion criteria. Examples of the criteria are a person's age, type of disease, medical history, and current health. Inclusion criteria help make sure that all the people in the clinical trial are medically similar. For example, the, clinical, the inclusion criteria may require that each participant have the same kind of cancer or the same stage of disease, such as stage 2A colorectal cancer. If the people have too many medical differences, the doctors will have more difficulty interpreting the results. Likewise, exclusion criteria help keep people safe. For example, it is often not safe for patients with a severe heart condition or kidney failure to receive some cancer treatments, so they may have to be excluded from some clinical trials. Exclusion criteria are not used to reject people personally, but to protect people from potential risks and increase what doctors and researchers can learn from each study. Each clinical trial follows a set of rules called a protocol. A protocol describes inclusion and exclusion criteria, the schedule of tests, procedures, medications, and doses, 
and the length of the study. For each trial you're interested in, read the protocol summary. This document contains such information as the purpose of the trial, the treatments being tested, and the locations where the trial is taking place. Much of the information will be in medical language, so if you're having trouble understanding it, print it out and talk, take it to your doctor to help you make sense of it. So now that you understand a little bit about what clinical trials are, you might be wondering what you'd have to pay if you participate in one. Previously, many states had their own state laws regarding insurance coverage for clinical trials. Some of them were limited to cancer clinical trials, others applied to all types of approved clinical trials. However, when the Affordable Care Act was passed in 2010, it outlined many changes with respect to health insurance coverage generally and health insurance coverage with respect to clinical trials. As part of the ACA, or Affordable Care Act, health plans or insurers cannot deny patients participation in a clinical trial, limit or deny coverage of routine costs to patients who choose to participate in an improved clinical trial or increase costs because a patient chooses to participate in a clinical trial. This means that your insurer cannot limit your benefits if you choose to enroll in a clinical trial. Specifically, the ACA states that health plans or insurers cannot keep patients from joining a clinical trial, limit or deny coverage of routine costs to patients who choose to join an approved clinical trial, increase costs because a patient chooses to join a clinical trial. Your health insurance provider may also pro require you to visit a doctor or hospital who participates in your health plans network. However, if your plan includes coverage for out-of-network services, the insurer must cover your routine costs of care for an out-of-network clinical trial. An approved clinical trial is a study being done for the prevention, detection, or treatment of cancer or another life-threatening illness. According to the law, the clinical trial must be federally funded, have an investigational new drug, or IND, application, or be exempt from IND requirements. However, your doctor or the study sponsor can tell you if the clinical trial you're considering is covered by the Affordable Care Act. Federally funded. This means that the clinical trial is approved or funded by one or more of the organizations listed below. National Institutes of Health, which includes organizations under the NIH, such as the National Cancer Institute, NCI, and organizations funded by the NIH or NCI, such as academic institutions, designated cancer centers, and cooperative groups. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC. Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, AHRQ. Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS. Department of Defense, Department of Veterans Affairs, or the Department of Energy if the trial is subject to unbiased scientific review by experts that is similar to NIH requirements. Has an in investigational new drug, IND, application. Researchers must submit an IND application to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, or FDA, in many instances to give the drug in clinical trials. Your doctor or the sponsor of the clinical trial will be able to tell you if this study has an IND requirement. Is exempt from IND application requirements. In certain situations, researchers do not need to request permission from the FDA to study an approved drug or treatment. This occurs when the research is not being is not being done to request FDA approval for such changes as changing the drug's labeling, advertising a new use, or testing a new dosage or way to give the drug. Does my state require insurance coverage for clinical trials? Under the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of 2010, insurance companies are required to cover routine costs when a patient enrolls in a clinical trial under the following conditions. Number one, the patient must be eligible for a clinical trial. Number two, the clinical trial must be an approved clinical trial. And number three, the physician treating the patient at a healthcare facility where the patient will receive treatment must either be in network or the insurance plan must provide for out of network coverage. However, this requirement does not apply to health insurance plans issued before 323 2010. 
if you have a grandfathered health insurance plan, the ACA protections might not apply to you. Policies issued prior to 3-23-2010 are grandfathered unless substantial changes. Policies issued on or after 3-23-2010 are non-grandfathered. A grandfathered plan must notify you of its grandfathered status and all informational materials that describe your plan benefits. However, if you are currently seeking, if you're even if you are currently on a grandfathered plan, you must have options. You may have options if you are seeking enrollment in a clinical trial and are facing obstacles from your insurance company. First, it makes sense for you or your family. You may be able to purchase a new health insurance plan through the federal or state health insurance marketplace during open enrollment so that you will have a non-grandfathered plan. Additionally, some non-grandfathered plans already provide coverage for clinical trial costs, either due to state law as previously mentioned or just because that is the insurer's policy. Not covered. For example, your insurance company would not be required to cover the costs of a new drug that is being tested. That would be paid for by the pharmaceutical company or grant that is funding the new trial. Another example, let's say your insurance would cover two scans per year, but the clinical trial requires scans every other month for data collection and analysis. Your insurance company would still cover the two scans and the additional four would be covered by the trial. Medicare. The Affordable Care Act does not affect Medicare coverage of clinical trials. Medicare already covers the routine costs related to clinical trials and will continue to cover these costs. Medicare covers the following costs associated with a clinical trial. Any drugs, procedures, and services you need while participating in the trial that would normally be covered through Medicare, even if you were not participating in the trial. Medicare care needed to give the treatment being studied. For example, care related to the actual administration of chemotherapy would be covered, but the new but the drug may not be. Medical care related to any health complications from the clinical trial, such as prevention and management of side effects. Medicare does not cover any research related costs. The, there are special rules for people enrolled in Medicare managed care plans called Medicare Advantage plans. If you are enrolled in a Medicare managed care plan, Traditional Medicare coverage provides coverage of the routine patient costs of a clinical trial. The Medicare Managed Care Plan pay, pays any difference between your out-of-pocket costs in traditional Medicare and your out-of-pocket costs in your Medicare Managed Care Plan. Just like under private health insurance, Medicare is not required to cover some non-routine costs. Medicaid. The Affordable Care Act clinical trials coverage provision does not apply to Medicaid plans. However, under the Clinical Treatment Act passed in 2020 and in effect since January 1st, 2022, Medicaid is required to provide coverage of clinical trials. A Medicaid plan must make a determination within 72 hours if a patient qualifies for coverage of a clinical trial. Medicaid must cover routine costs of a clinical trial at any phase. A state or territory Medicaid plan must cover routine costs, out-of-state clinical trials. Medicaid must cover routine patient costs even if the network, if the doctor or hospital is now in the network of the beneficiary's Medicaid managed care plan. So you can see here just the summary of what I just said um, so that it will be helpful as you think about clinical trials covered under Medicaid. What if your insurance denies coverage for the clinical trial? Well, it's a good idea to contact your healthcare team to see if they can assist you. You can also contact your insurance company to find out why they denied coverage. Also, it's a good idea to go through your insurance internal appeals process and contact your state insurance agency to see if you're eligible for an external appeals process or independent medical review. 
Note, we do have a step-by-step -step guide to insurance appeals on our website, theclrc.org. You may need to go through the internal appeals process before seeking an internal review, an external review, but hopefully your healthcare team and or the study sponsors might be able to provide some assistance with appealing the insurance company's decision. Sometimes we hear from patients who need to access experimental treatment outside a clinical trial. There may be any number of reasons as to why some people are unable to enroll in a clinical trial. Maybe there are no trials currently recruiting new patients for the type of cancer the person has, or maybe there aren't any trials at all. Maybe the person is not in the age range that is being tested. Maybe some person's kidneys or liver aren't functioning well enough to qualify, or maybe the trials are out of state or in another part of the state and are too logistically challenging to get to or deal with. If the person is unable to access new or experimental treatment through a clinical trial, there may be other options available depending on your specific situation. These are three potential options. Expanded access, sometimes referred to as compassionate use, is a program run by the Food and Drug Administration which provides a venue to ex access experimental drugs outside of a clinical trial. When a patient is unable to use the investigational medication as part of a clinical trial, whether because a patient is not eligible for any ongoing clinical trials or there are no ongoing clinical trials, patients may be able to receive the product when appropriate through the expanded access program. If that is the case, the patient must first obtain FDA approval. How does a patient get approval for compassionate use medications? Number one, the patient and a licensed physician are both willing to participate. Number two, the physician determines that there are no comparable or satisfactory treatment available to monitor or treat the condition. Number three, the probable risk of taking the investigational medication is not greater than the probable risk from the condition. Number four, the FDA determines that there is a sufficient evidence that the investigational medication is safe and effective to support its use in the circumstances and that providing the medication will not interfere with clinical investigations to support marketing approval. Number five, the sponsor, the company developing the medication, clinical investigator or patient's physician must submit a clinical protocol, which is a document describing the treatment plan for the patient that is consistent with FDA regulations. And number six, the patient must be unable to obtain the investigational drug through participation in a clinical trial. Patient safety being a priority, the FDA must determine the potential benefit justifies the risk, that the risk is reasonable in that context. Even with safeguards, there are always risks and unknowns about safety and effectiveness. What are some hurdles to receiving medication under compassionate use? The pharmaceutical company or the company sponsoring the medication must agree to provide the medication under a compassionate use program. The FDA cannot require a company to provide an investigational drug for compassionate use access. Allowing a patient to use a specific medication is at the discretion of the company who makes the decision, who makes the medication. Cost. Individuals may have to pay the costs out of pocket for the use of the medication under compassionate use unless the pharmaceutical company is willing to provide the medication at no charge. Often, health insurance companies do not cover the cost of compassionate use medications. Individuals should contact their insurance company for more information. Company discontinues expanded access. A pharmaceutical company that was providing an investigational new drug under compassionate use may decide to stop providing it. The company you ask could refuse your request and or withdraw approval. The FDA cannot compel a sponsor to provide it. If the company refuses to allow you to continue using a prescription drug, you may try putting pressure on the pharmaceutical company through social media or developing a petition on change.org to plead with them to not discontinue a drug that is working for you. Right to try. Right to Try was signed into law in 2018. 
Right to Try gives terminally ill patients the right to request to use experimental medications that have not yet been approved by the Food and Drug Administration. The laws do not require physicians to prescribe experimental therapies, do not require insurance companies to pay for them, and do not require manufacturers to provide them. The bill is intended to encourage drug makers to more freely provide more expensive experimental medicines by limiting the drug maker's liability. The law directs the drug makers to submit to the Department of Health and Human Services an annual summary of use under the right to try provisions of their experimental products. These reports are to include the number of doses supplied, the number of patients treated, the uses for which the drug was made available, and any known adverse side effects. The name and the way that this law has been talked about have, have been pretty misleading for consumers and may give false hope to many. And this allows people to request medications that have only made it through phase one trials, as we already discussed earlier in this webinar. Most drugs that pass phase one don't end up getting approved for a multitude of reasons, including that they might not actually be effective. Despite good intentions and the legislation's name, right to try legislation grants no rights. It merely grants permission for a patient to try to get experimental medication from a pharmaceutical company. Patients are allowed to try experimental drugs, but nothing in the legislation will make it mandatory for pharmaceutical companies to provide these medications. What is off-label drug use? Off-label prescription drug use <clears throat> is when someone is prescribed medication by a physician that is used to treat a condition other than what the medication is approved to treat by the Food and Drug Administration or FDA, or intended to treat by the pharmaceutical company that makes the drug. Off-label means that using the drug in a different way than suggested on the drug label, i.e. taking the medication for a different illness or using different doses than intended or taking it in a different form than listed on the table, on the label. Will a doctor prescribe off-label drug use? Doctors usually only prescribe drugs for off-label use when they believe that it will treat the patient's condition more safely and effectively than would any approved treatment. It is legal and very common in cancer treatment because many cancer drugs are effective against more than one form of cancer and because many treatment plans involve the use of multiple drugs. However, doctors may not want to prescribe off-label use medications because it carries a legal risk as well if the patient experiences an adverse reaction to taking the off-label medication. What is the FDA approval process? When the FDA is satisfied that the investigational drug is safe and effective, the FDA will then work with the pharmaceutical company on creating a drug label report, including approved conditions and dosage regulations, which will be made available to all health professionals who prescribe or sell the drug to patients. Insurance coverage for off-label drugs. Coverage of off-label prescription drugs is often a big hurdle. Many insurance companies are not willing to pay for medication used <clears throat> in an unapproved manner and has the right to deny payments for off-label use of prescription medication. <clears throat> Most health insurance plans cover off-label cancer treatments if the off-label use is listed in an improved summary or list called a compendium. A compendium is a list put together by medical experts who have researched off-label uses of particular drugs. If your doctor prescribes an off-label drug, you should consult your health plan's explanation of benefits or EOB to find out whether your insurance policy covers off-label drug use. <clears throat> This concludes our presentation. Thank you so much for your time with us. If you have general questions about today's presentation or need clarification, I'm going to stop the recording in just a moment and take time for questions. If you have questions about your specific legal matter as it relates to cancer, please call our intake line so we can take a look at your issue and provide you with specific resources and customized solutions and referrals. Thank you so much.